Okay, we are at the hour. It's two o'clock. So let's get started. Well, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, in this session, we have Jeff McGuddle, Norman Kerr, and Jolene Adams from University of Oregon demonstrating NVIL 3.0. We're very excited about this. We also have Anna Thompson and Nina Fox from the board joining me as co-hosts. The three of us will help monitor the chat and the Q&A area. Um, you're all muted during the during the webinar, but if you have any questions or comments during the presentation, um, please feel free to send them our way. Um, we don't have closed captioning for the live event, but closed captioning will be added in post-production. Okay, I'm going to turn the mic over to our presenters. Thank you, Weiwei. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeff Magato. I'm the director of the Model Language Center at the University of Oregon, and I'm very pleased to have this chance, along with my uh, co-developers, to talk to you about Anvil, a project that goes back to uh, 2007, 2008. So we're calling it Anvil 3.0, but it's probably more like Anvil 30.0, but who can keep track of 30.0 except Google and, and uh, Firefox? Um, I'd like to introduce um, Norman and Jolene, or let them say hello too. Hi, um, my name is Jolene, and um, I have been working on the Anvil Help Wiki so that there are online help resources for how um, to use Anvil and some of the most common issues people come across, and also um, information on uh, features that are very popular and you might want to try. So I'll put a link to that in the chat if you're interested to take a look. And I, um, I'm Norman Kerr. I'm the I'm the main developer for Anvil, and I've been working on it since yeah 2008. And I'm here just to answer any technical questions for you guys. So, being language teachers, we thought we would start um, the, the webinar with a task. So, up in front of you is an actual Anvil page, um, a lesson, and much like you would you or your colleagues would do if you want your uh, students to access the lesson and you don't have a learning management system in play, um, you share a link much as I've just done here. And I see that Nina's just put it in the chat. So if you copy and paste that link into, um, I strongly encourage you to use Firefox or Chrome. Uh, we're gonna be doing several things with speech and uh, Edge and Safari just don't cut it with, with speech. So if you go ahead and fire up the lesson you see in front of you, we're gonna ask you to do the task that is down below. And this is the task that's down below. One of Anvil's longtime core features has been a thing that we call VoiceBoard, basically an asynchronous speech tool. Um, nothing new here in terms of, uh, you know, asynchronous speech tools. We've had these for quite some time. Version 1 and 1 1.5 of Anvil were in Flash. Eventually we got out of Flash and we're doing everything in HTML5, have been for a while. Um, but on Saturday night, uh, the 46th season of Saturday Night Live kicked off and we thought you might enjoy talking a little bit or seeing a little bit about what season one, in fact, episode one of season one was about. So take a second once you get loaded in and uh, play the video. I'm not sure I got my... Good evening. Good evening. For me... I'm going to stop it there, not to give away the surprise, but what we'd like you to do is uh, watch the short video, and when you're ready to, talk about what you like or dislike about the method of teaching you're going to see. Uh, please open up a little message. 
And that for some reason or another, uh, shyness being one, you don't feel comfortable using your voice, you can type in something, but we'd actually prefer you to speak your feedback about the video and about the method of English language teaching you see in front of you. And to do that, if you click on record, you'll get a button that looks like this or a screen that looks like this. If you're shy like me, you might choose to do audio instead of video. And if you see that ball bouncing in front of you, you know you're ready to begin recording. Take three seconds and say, well, clearly the relationship between this teacher and this student is not one that I would emulate. I won't say anything more. If you like that message, go ahead and say it looks good. If you don't like it, and by I say like, you can play it back. And say, well, clearly the relationship between this teacher and this student is not. I think that sounds just great. I'm going to say, OK. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, I'm watching the chat in here. Looks like folks just need a little bit more time switching tasks here. Um, Sounds good. I'll run are, through the. Yeah, working on login and, and uh, needing a little bit of time to watch the video. Sounds good. So I'll go ahead and complete mine. But the rest of you, I hope you got the link. I hope you're able to log in. And once you do, if you just scroll down to the first task, click on the video and offer your response. And in the meantime, we'll answer any questions you might have. Um, looks like some folks have login questions. Let's see. So my friend Tung from Thailand says, I remember uh, it works well with Chrome, but not so well with Safari. And that's definitely right. We can do audio recordings with uh, Safari, but we can't do videos, Tung. So if you're trying to um, get your students to use video more, um, stay, away from Fire, stay away from Safari and Edge for that matter. Norman, do you have a suggestion for Alexandria? She says she getting a connection closed or timed out error. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly why that would be happening. You are using social login, right? It looks like folks are using Facebook and Google. Do you have a recommendation? Which one will work better? Um, they should both work fine. Um, and Jerry said Facebook did not work for him. Mm -hmm. OK. Thank you, Jerry. Um, and thank you, Stephen. Aloha, Stephen. He's in Hawaii. Thanks, Alexandria. We'll be glad to work through with you uh, afterwards. And that's great, Mercedes. You should be able to go right to the task. Thanks, Georgia. I'll refresh the page and see if we can see your post. Ah, yes. Um, Georgia, we don't see you, but we see Jean. Jean, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> so 
So Jean rightfully complains about that old audio lingual method where we mindlessly repeated things even though we had no idea what they meant or they didn't make sense. And kudos to you for doing it in Spanish. Kelly, do you mind if I uh, share your recording? Thank you. I'm hoping everybody can hear play through. Um, panelists, let me know if you don't hear Kelly. Thank you, Jerry. Um, well, uh, that was um, Saturday Night Live is one of my favorite uh, programs on TV. And I thought that that was a very good example of comedy and a very poor example of teaching techniques. And I think we could enumerate some of those teaching techniques. Um, let me refresh my screen and we'll uh, see if somebody else talks about some of those very poor teaching techniques that uh, Kelly just mentioned. I'll pick on Stephen because I know him and I'm sure he won't mind. Well, There we are, three time zones away. Stephen, do you mind if I play yours? Thank you. I noticed that the tone is set between teacher and student from the very beginning where the student says good morning or good evening or whatever it is. Uh, and the teacher just doesn't respond. He's looking at his watch. So uh, in a nutshell, there's no, the relationship between the teacher and student is simply problematic. That's why it's funny, I guess. <laughs> yeah, um, he couldn't wait to get it over with. Um, in the interest of time, I, I, I'd encourage you to continue to contribute. This is meant to be as interactive of a session as possible. And uh, do take the time afterwards to listen and hear what your colleagues uh, I see uh, a colleague from Turkey, Damla, logged in. So there's lots of opinions from different places. Um, I hope nobody thought that uh, this was a model of instruction that we should be emulating. Um, but it also, I think, brings to mind what you know, language labs once upon a time were called to do. You know, put students in nice, nice rows and separate them with glass panels, not unlike the. Uh, panels that get in front of us and all of our the people we try to talk to today and uh, isolate people and uh, just have them repeat mind, mind silly things and with no attention to meaning whatsoever. So Anvil very much is not designed to be that. It's designed to be um, very open-ended, very meaning focused and as with all sort of I think asynchronous discussion tools, the secret sauce really lies in, you know, what the prompt is, whether that's an audio or a video or a poem or whatever. And then those three or four or five questions you pose, depending on the length of response you're looking for and the level of, you know, obviously the language level of your students. But you know, there's nothing magical here. I think tools like Flipgrid have really elevated this sort of teaching uh, to a, you know, a, a stage where, um, you know, a company like Microsoft buys out Flipgrid. Um, Anvil does, does, does it and has been doing it for quite some time. And this is sort of like our, our core tool. And probably 75% of the use of Anvil is strictly this voice board tool. Um, I want to go a little bit further this in this session today, and so we hope to. Well, let me show you the agenda for the for the talk and give you a sense of where we hope to be going. So we just uh, gave you a hands-on task with uh, Anvil doing the voice board, um, and 
I'd like to move into a couple of other tools um, and at the same time explain a rationale for you know, what's behind them. I keep saying tools, but really our toolbox is the H5P set of tools layered in with our Anvil engine. So there's a few things that we do in Anvil that we think make the H5P tools particularly interesting and useful for language teachers. And primarily that's you know, giving you teachers access to speech and video um, in any way, shape or form that, 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 they, that they want. Um, so wherever the H5P tool permits it, we allow you to insert audio for video. And you'll see some examples of that. Um, we just looked at one lesson. We're gonna look at a lesson, a Portuguese lesson in a second. And then after that, um, another English lesson focused on the crisis that's in Belarus, just to kind of go from the lighter and more uh, comedic, hopefully, to um, the more serious and obviously different levels of language. Um, at the bottom of this page, and you don't have to wait for me, we deliberately put about nine different Anvil task types on this page. Um, you're welcome to scroll down and, you know, if you're really interested in um, interactive video, for example. If you scroll down to the bottom, there's uh, uh, an interactive video that's just waiting to be discovered about how reading instruction was envisioned 30 years ago. I guess I'm kind of living in the past a little bit today. And we'll conclude today's session with, you know, sort of obviously Q&A and a little bit of a roadmap of where we're going and what we're trying to do with the tool, okay? Please use the chat. Uh, um, we've got great panelists, including besides Jolene and Norman, who are glad to answer your questions while I'm while I'm talking. So just a quick, uh, there's several ways to get into Anvil. Um, we learned today that Google seemed to work and Facebook didn't, so we'll have to dig back into our Facebook authentication. Um, most of our students at the University of Oregon log in. Um, via their duck ID, their school authentic, our school authentication. And they do so right into either Canvas or the standalone Anvil. Um, Anvil's built, built to be quite flexible. So if you're a single teacher working on your own, you don't have access to a learning management system, Anvil will work just fine for you. Um, but like increasingly, many of us, if not most of us, have access to a learning management system these days. So um, Anvil will work, as you can see on the right there, inside tools like Canvas. Um, and we'll definitely discuss the pros and cons and the ins and outs of that. Um, one of our panelist today, Nina Fox, who's staying in the background, um, has a particularly special insight into, uh, she's our uh, Canvas administrator at the University of Oregon, and, and, you know, she understands in a way that I could never, um, what it takes for a tool to really run well and, and not blow up the learning management system. So suffice it to say, we spent a long time to get this LTI thing down and working well. Um, you saw your voice board. I just thought I'd show up, uh, you know, a couple of others and kinds of ways that people are used, have used it in the past. Um, students can not only, you know, present their own video, they can add their other videos, they can use text. Um, it really depends upon what, you know, what kind of response the teacher's looking for, and you know, obviously, again, the language level of the students. It can do listen and repeat quite well, but it doesn't have to do just listen and repeat, as, the, as you can see in some of these. Behind the scenes, just uh, you know, another purpose of today's webinar is to give you a look at what things look like. I'm going to blow this up. But that's a little bit small and uh, hopefully you can still see it just fine. Um, but one reason the voice board is so popular is it takes about five minutes to make one, if that. And if you already know what you want to ask and how you want to ask it, um, 
uh, it's about three clicks to make it happen. Um, but in the background, you pick your content type, which we'll go through in a second. You type in your prompt. If you have media, you can add it. As it says here, media can be just about anything. You can open or restrict the response documents as much or as little as you want. Um, so if you are only focused on writing, then you may just you know, open up text or documents. But um, you know, Anvil's core uh, essence is speech. And so um, um, students get to select the audio or video or, um, or you can select it and only enable one or the other. And you know, there's lots of uh, conversation we can have about you know, the, the pluses and minuses of one over the other. And finally, um, it doesn't have to be an open discussion board. It can also be a private one. So just by toggling the switch here, dragging it to the from right to left, you can turn on public or private. And if it's private, then only the teacher or teachers, if more than one person is running the course, uh, see the see the the posting and the student only sees her own. So that's uh, what it looks like in the back. So I'm going to um, give you another language task and jump back and scroll down again. So we just did something with speaking. We thought it might be kind of fun to do something with listening. So this short video, actually, it's one part of a 10 minute video, it's two minutes, and we probably, I probably won't give you the full two minutes, but I'd like you to play and interact with the video. So this is an example of what H5P calls the interactive video content type. Um, you might know commercial tools that do something similar like um, Play Posit or Edge of Puzzle or Canvas Studio. Um, you know, this whole sort of idea of in video questions, I think, really surged once MOOCs became popular. Uh, Coursera did this early on. And, and frankly, for me, this is sort of the killer app um, in the H5, H5P tools for, for language teachers. Um, from an authoring perspective, the, degree of difficulty goes up a little bit, but if you have access to a video, you now have a tool that lets you ask all of those questions that you used to have to ask and play back and play back in class. You have a way of having students do that before they even come to class. So that maybe, you know, sort of lower order kinds of comprehension questions, you know, the simple factual based things, the kinds of things we often use true, false, or multiple choice for, you know, students can work on on their own. So that if we do part one for homework, uh, when they come in and do part two, um, you know, the, the, the kind of questioning and the kind of task that we can do becomes a little bit different because they've already found out who this woman is and how she feels about teaching. So take a second and uh, if you will, and just run through the video. Um, I'm going to give you two minutes, so that should be enough time to at least get a feel for what it looks like and what the kind of response is. Julian, did you happen to notice any questions that came up that we can talk about while folks are working? Well, they are, um, they've all been addressed really well in the Q&A, but I do think um, one question that seems to be um, persistent is a question about LTI and integrating Anvil into Canvas. Um, in particular, there's one question um, about if, if it's available in Canvas's course settings and apps. Um, yeah, so maybe if you can explain a little bit about LTI integration generally, that would be great. <laughs> Norma, would you like to explain a little bit about LTI integration, well, at least from the technical side? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm trying to, I'm 
read, there's, I think, a couple, or at least one question about LTI. So basically, um, uh, for LTI to work um, for your institution, um, we have to go through a process of um, getting it okayed with your institution, then we give them um, some credentials and they can add it to their LMS. And, um, and basically um, you can create um, different LMSs, call it different things, but an assignment and that creates uh, a lesson. Um, and so when students click on the link, it um, basically shows you a lesson in Anvil. Um, and so, yeah, we have, I think, I don't know, 15 or so schools that are currently using it in their LMSs. But yeah, the process can be a few days to a month, depending on the institution. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Norman. And a simple question. Um, people are asking if there will be a copy of this lesson available afterwards um, or if they can have access to the lesson. So that's so an that's easy a, one. Yes. <laughs> the lesson link that people have up at the top will for forever and ever and ever. So save that link. Okay, and we had one more come up that's related. Um, so this is from Georgia and she asks, um, this is a lesson created on an Anvil platform when we log into our account, we can add a lesson, right? Correct. Yep, and so, those are all, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I was just gonna say, Georgia, once you're out of this lesson, you can go to your dashboard or click up at the top, click on lessons and click on plus lesson and you're creating a lesson. So again, the hamburger menu at the top left will give you access to that. Okay, sorry for the chatting uh, while you're trying to learn about Benet's fascinating life, but hopefully you learned enough that you discovered... What was that special present she got from her grandfather? Yay, Yasin. First prize goes to <laughs> Yasin. Uh, and if you were really paying attention, you learned the Portuguese word for dolls. Anybody pick that up or any Portuguese speakers out there? Uh, close, Bronwyn and <laughs> Bonecas there, Carlos, fantastic. <laughs> so, Obviously, um, well, whether this would be a subtitled or not, um, you know, we subtitled it for a multilingual audience, but um, I think you can see that by putting the learner in control of how she wants to listen, how much she wants to take in, giving her that ability to back up, and go forward, by the time this two minutes is done, it's actually for the learners, it's about a 15 minute task. You know, this is something that we probably use with the high beginner, low intermediate. Um, um, and, uh, and I think really sets the stage for, you know, a more interesting discussion about, you know, what made this woman become a teacher. I'm going to jump into the editing side of the tools just so you can see what a teacher sees. And as always, when you go to the editing side, you know, there's lots of boxes and things. Don't be put off by all of the different boxes. Um, I think the one thing that makes this particular tool pretty easy is it's really <laughs> step one, step two, step three. Step one is really simple, get your video. And with us, you can use 
a YouTube video, you can use a Vimeo video, you can upload something you have, or you can record your own right here. So my friend Tung, for example, is, our, is a Thai teacher. He doesn't have perhaps as much access to his, well, he's got access to lots of videos, but he also likes to use this tool with himself, you know, as the being the source. So three ways of getting authentic video into your lesson. The interactions is where the magic happens. And again, we don't have time today to go into too much, but you saw several different kinds of interactions at play. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, the, you know, they go pretty much from the simple, if you're just trying to identify something or, you know, mark up the text. If you're doing, you know, a close listening, you might want to you know, point learner's attention at things. Um, I've never used the table, but I'm sure someone has to, uh, you know, present data on screen that makes, um, you know, makes sense in columns and rows. Uh, links is very useful if you want to say, okay, let's go and look and see what that birthplace of Binet. Um, in fact, did we do that here? I can't remember. <laughs> até a universidade. Foi onde eu me formei, onde eu me eduquei, onde eu cresci. Um, well, I was looking for more markup, but I didn't I didn't see it. Um, you can insert an image. I think we have a map in this. You can pose multiple choice questions. So I'll come back to statements. This is a single choice, you know, only one correct answer, multiple multiple choice with more than one correct answer, true, false, and so on. Um, you know, if you want to start simple, you know, do what you're already doing. You know, true, false questions and multiple choice questions about factual information will at least save you 15 minutes of class time um, um, uh, that you don't have to spend on getting the core details or, or the core information of, of, of a text. I think some of the really cool things happen at the end um, when you can pose, you know, a little bit, you know, once students are farther along in the video, you can begin to get them to try to put together the knowledge that they've attained about the, the, the task. So, you know, a simple drag and drop close is kind of nice for that. And then that summary tool at the end is nice because it sort of builds in, um, you know, a, a global comprehension check. And it works it's sort of a multiple choice. You give some statements and a correct, straight, a correct statement yields another correct statement and so on. So that's what the, interactive video content type looks like. And someone was asking me earlier, you know, how do I get that into my lesson? Well, once you've created a lesson of your own, up here at the top, if you click on add content, you begin to see some of the authoring possibilities that are available to you. Um, we just saw voice board with the Saturday Night Live. We've now just seen interactive video. And when I click on that, I get a blank one. I, YouTube or Vimeo, record your own, upload something that you already have stored. Those are your three ways of getting the source content in. Interactions we just looked at and summary we also just looked at. There's some nice ways of changing behavior. <laughs> um, you can alter where the video starts. You can do a variety of things, including taking away the solution if you really want students to you know, exert more effort after meaning. Um, you can have it play automatically, um, but you don't have to mess with it. Most of the time, I don't change anything here because I've already selected my video pretty carefully and I know what I want to use. Um, this is not a tool to use with a two hour feature film. It's a very good tool to use, I think, with, um, inter with beginning, intermediate, and low advanced learners on the, in the sort of one minute to five minute sort of segments as everything with video in online instruction and um, short, many short things is always better than uh, some, 
a lot of long ones. And I'm getting videos missing. By the way, you can easily get rid of something just by deleting it like that. You can also export it. So if you're an H5P user and you use H5P in other areas, uh, like on the H5P site itself, uh, you can export it and it'll work there. Okay. Julian, I want to check in with you. Any questions come up about interactive video? Um, no, I, uh, there have been some good comments, um, but no questions. Okay. Um, I think we there were some questions in the Q&A. Thank you, Weiwei. Uh, I was just looking at the... Um, nice. Okay, here we go. Um, here's one from Stephen. Could you do a quick... Uh, it says, could you do a quick build of a close to show us the editing interface of a close activity like uh, C L O Z E? <laughs> gotcha. Um, <laughs> great. That's a great question, Stephen. And I think I'll save it for Belarus. How about that? So I want to give folks uh, a third type of interaction. So both voice boards and interactive video typically will sit on a page by themselves. They'll, they'll be one piece of homework. I mean, you could have two or three videos that students work through, um, or you can adopt one of the, uh, I think, really great tools from H5P, which is this thing called course presentation. Again, I keep mentioning these things, but if I go back up here, um, that's this tool right here. And uh, course presentation is an agglutinator. <laughs> it, it lets you uh, take different types of tasks, such as interactive video, such as, you know, uh, fill in the blanks, such as uh, uh, drag and drop, and put them all together in a sequence. And recently I had the good fortune of teaching a group of Fulbrighters who were on their way to teach in um, former Soviet Union and, the so and Russia and Ukraine. And so they were particularly interested in what's going on with Belarus. And so here's the course presentation tool. Um, and um, you're gonna see several different kinds of tasks involved. Um, but the core idea was here was to get students from knowing very little perhaps about the situation in Belarus and these students would be, you know, intermediate, high intermediate, to the point where they could listen to a New York Times podcast and get something meaningful out of it. So here we're talking about what are the kinds of scaffolding tools you can build in to take learners from the very narrow and the very confined to something that's much, uh, much broader. And it's sort of divided into two parts, and you can kind of decide for yourself what you're more interested in. The first part is sort of focused on reading. So they have a headline from the New York Times, something broke inside Belarusians, why an apolitical people rose up. And then they have the subheading, these come directly from the New York Times. So again, this is just a nice way of bringing in authentic materials in a you know fairly straightforward way. I'll show you the editing behind it in a second. Um, but the students aren't ready nor able to read that New York Times article. But hopefully they're able to get enough out of that headline and the subheading that they could begin to process the text if it's, you know, rephrased, paraphrased in language that is more appropriate for them. So here again is sort of that close or, direct, you know, a, 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 a multiple choice close. Uh, and uh, I'll show you what it looks like after you have a chance to play with it. If you're more interested in audio, excuse me, my large dog has suddenly gotten very uh, interested in Anvil too. Um, you can see how Anvil, again, with this course presentation tool, lets me put uh, a snippet of that podcast that they're listening to. Contested re-election of the incumbent president Alexander Lukashenko. In Belarus, President Alexander Lukashenko has won the presidential vote with 79.9%. According. And here we're kind of doing more traditional comprehension checking, 
But this particular tool, which is called statement, lets you give students a statement and then it will yield another statement. And so again, you're kind of trying to build up what was the big point of that minute and 22 second. And I think I have, my idea here was possibly to do this in groups, but maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves, but it doesn't have to be, you know, each student doing all five. It can easily be a group, you know, one group does part one, one group does part two, and then as an all jigsaw task, they try to put their parts back together again. But you can see that this, inter this um, course presentation tool allows me to put multiple kinds of media. So here's that interactive video again about this third part, just using a simple video oh, that I made. As I come to the rally to the main independence square, I walk through the side streets that lead to it and I see that there are all these coach buses parked on the sides with so I just happened to, you know, find a nice photo that illustrated what I was talking about it. But that's, you know, just, uh, um, you know, that's a Jeff made movie there. That's not a real movie. That's just the podcast with uh, some photos in front of it. But as we saw with the Binet exercise here again, you know, we can do the assessment check right inside with, um, you know, with interactive video. So this is interactive video running inside of the course presentation. And so that's the, you know, I think the great thing about both course presentation and another tool that we won't see today called Column, which does the same thing, but instead of a, in a landscape layout like course presentation, it does it in a portrait view. So H5P has this cool ability to not just, you know, give students one kind of task, but to actually use the various tasks to scaffold to something that gets increasingly more complex and perhaps you know, more differentiated. And I see I'm running really short on time. So um, I guess in this one, I don't have anything special, but again, from the authoring point of view, Um, so here's my first slide. Notice it's just a text and a link, an image, and another image. So, you know, fairly rich media, you know, I mean, the kind of thing that, you know, you would copy and paste into a, you know, Word document in previous days um, just becomes, um, you know, fairly easily constructed um, in the digital age. Nobody's asked yet about copyright, so I won't say anything about that. Um, here's that the drag and drop or drag the words task. Um, this one looks ugly from the back end, but it's really easy to construct. Um, your instructions are here. And to construct one, you can take any piece of text and use that old fashioned line of demarcation of asterisk before and after the word. You can also put in clues if you like. Um, and, you know, so it's a couple of sentences with five missing words, very easy to construct. And it yields something that hopefully will take the students it won't take them long because it's obviously guessing plays a big part of it, but um, this would be a good one to keep check on but not have solution turned so that, you know, they actually do have to puzzle through the text or hopefully they're puzzling through the text. I was going to hopefully give you a chance to uh, um, <laughs> play more with it, but um, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, check in again with questions. Jolene? Um, if you had a quick moment, Jeff, there's a question about showing learner outcomes. And I think that that could be a quick, if you could just go down and show them where the outcomes and how to share the lesson are, I think that would be valuable. That's, thank you. Um, I won't have too many learner outcomes. Well, actually I will, because you, you all have been working on it too. So the bottom, 
And we're working on making this more prominent. We realize it's a little too subtle, but the vertical ellipsis, the green button with the three dots at the bottom is where outcomes show up. So by clicking that, and depending on how many people have been working on things, we get Good, I can see people have been working on country music while, while we've been talking and that's great. So this first task is, you know, th this one makes a lot more sense when you only have one task per page and you're interested in, you know, how long did it take your students to do it and how did they do in general? It's not one to do with this where I have nine different or eight different tasks going. But you can parse it out a little bit. You can look at it by learner and I hope people don't mind seeing their name on screen. And I'm sure those of you who are active users of things like the Canvas Gradebook are wondering, um, does this go into the Canvas Gradebook? And, and the answer is currently no. Um, these stats only show up for you. Um, um, so either it's being very slow to respond or for some reason users is not showing up. Let me see if I can get. So again, um, this is an example page where you would, <laughs> um, but you can see you know, how much time people spent on a certain task. Um, what, what task got used if you were, you know, giving learners choices around, say, you know, something very um, straightforward and um, like the dictation task um, versus something more analytical like the one we just did about Belarus. Um, but the idea is how much time did they spend on it, how they do, and how many people or how many times was it attempted. I'm not sure why users doesn't, doesn't come up, but you also get a breakdown of every, every learner. Um, uh, and what they did, which task and, and scores. So it's a pretty, you know, sort of basic set of stats, um, but it seems to fulfill, you know, those sort of core questions of, did they do it? How, do, how well did they do? And, um, you know, what do I need to go over in class um, that clearly didn't make much sense? Um, so I hope that answers that. Um, Jolene also mentioned the share button, absolutely key. If you're, especially if you're not using, if you're not using this inside of a learning management system, you always have to share the lesson with your learners and you do that just by clicking the check mark there. Um, you can also personally invite them and you can also invite others and raise their privileges so that they can author too. Um, we make no distinction between teachers and students. It's whoever creates the lesson. So, you know, we have students at the University of Oregon creating lessons for their fellow students too, especially the interactive video. I think I'm going to uh, stop talking. It looks like you have discovered um, the rest of the page, but we just put some more examples of how H5P, what H5P and Anvil together can do. Um, that the, you know, this is the text tool in H5P. So everything you see on this page is created with Anvil and H5P. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's very self-contained. Um, um, I saw Alejandro's name um, a while back. We, we did another webinar about country music and I think this was one he particularly liked if I'm remembering correctly. So, you know, a simple, you know, snippet of a song um, and multiple choice. This is, this is the column. I guess I did have a column exercise. So what the course presentation does again in landscape view, column does in uh, portrait view. And that is, I can have one task, followed by another task, followed by another task, and so on. I can sort of just 
make the sequence, do the scaffolding um, like that. Um, another interactive video. Um, this unfortunately only works if you're in Chrome. It doesn't work in Firefox, but it uses Google's um, speech recognition to I to get an answer. And I hope some of you tried it. So it's actually an assessment of Russian or Serbian or Ukrainian and not an assessment of English. Um, you know, the more formulaic language items are, the more essential it is, I think, to make them, you know, to give learners the ability to play with them. So, you know, not only are they getting, you know, a transliteration, but they're seeing the core Persian script, and of course they can hear it as Panj. well. Um, so again, this is where Anvil comes into play. We, uh, we, you know, we give the instructor the ability to annotate with her voice any, any of the task. And last but not least, uh, if you didn't, if none of this made sense, the, hopefully the handouts that uh, we put here, there's one for each page. And I saw a question from Bronwyn um, earlier about the interface with, you know, how to get your, um, uh, how, how to see Anvil inside of Canvas. Um, that hopefully is explained there. Um, this isn't a detailed, uh, tutorial about all the tools. This is just about voice board and interactive, but they'll get you started. Oh, and one final thing. So everything that we talked about, we tried to put in the slides here. So this is course presentation again. Um, it walks you through that process of building an interactive video or letting you see what the uh, podcast task looked like on the inside. Last but not least, um, on the last page, there's some links to um, where you can get help about specific aspects of Anvil. And this is a time for, I'm gonna let Jolene do a shout out for her work. Um, you wanna tell them what, what else they can find at the help wiki, Jolene? Yeah, so I've been uh, adding some pages um, in as the chat goes along, but let's show us. Um, I'll put, first of all, the link here to the help wiki. Um, okay, so I'm going to post the link in the chat for everyone. Oh, panelists, perfect. Okay, so if you open that link, you will find help on interactive video, on column, on creating and setting up an account. And we actually have the page. Um, Jeff, do you mind if I go ahead and share my screen? Please do. I'm going to stop okay. sharing. Great. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes? Yeah. Fantastic. OK, so um, here we have the main Anvil homepage. Um, which you will see when you open the Anvil help link I just uh, put in the into the chat, you will come automatically here and you can click either here to go to the teacher's help page index or here for the student's help page index. So let's check out the teacher's help page. And on this page, when it opens, you will see first some brief instructions on how to best use this wiki page. And then you have help topics. And so you can open a topic. Um, here we have interactive video. Um, you open that and you will learn about how to do what you would want to do. So this is a great page to come to to explore some options. Um, you can also, um, let's say you just want to search on interactive video. You can use our search tool up here, interactive video, um, just like any search tool and then navigate the answers to find exactly what you're looking for. Um, so we also have, you can access that teacher index or the student's topic index over here on the left side. And we have a page of frequently asked questions. And again, a page solely dedicated on how to use the Anvil help desk. 
So those are the basics and the best way to learn it is just to get on and explore using that search tool or the teacher's index page. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. And I wanna give Norman a chance to talk about uh, um, where we're going. Um, so one of the things we promised in the abstract was uh, to talk about the mobile app and um, talk about the mobile app, Norman. Okay, um, <laughs> trying to get all these uh, questions answered. <laughs> um, so uh, we've been working on the mobile app and keep, keep pushing the timeline back because it's, it's quite a lot of work. Um, our plan is to release uh, um, iPhone and Android version of Anvil, um, hopefully by the end of this year or sometime in early. Uh, 2021. Um, and so that's, uh, that's probably the main thing that we're working on uh, for our future roadmap. The uh, other thing is um, better uh, outcomes um, and reporting for teachers. Um, it, it needs a lot of um, work still. Um, our hope uh, at some point for uh, people who use this in LTI is that we'll have um, uh, tight integration with um, uh, the LMS like Canvas where you create a assignment in in Anvil and automatically uh, imports it into your gradebook for for Canvas or or Moodle. So those are probably the two two things that we're most um, excited about uh, getting out in the next six months to a year. Right now, we're, we're proud that it works well, or it works inside of Canvas, but you know, hopefully in six months, we will be proud of the fact that it works really well inside of Canvas. And um, somebody asked about old lessons, and you know, if you've been with us for a while, we, we, we certainly uh, you know, hope you don't go away. So if you are an Anvil 2 user and you've done things in H5P, if you log into your Anvil 2 site, Anvil Classic, uh, and export those H5P tools, um, you can now import them. Or likewise, if you have things on h5p.org, uh, you just drag them in. And we have a site, the University of Virginia, where they had over 150 interactive videos. And um, they had to do them one by one, but they all imported eventually. So. Um, Yes, there is a path for, for the old. And Jeff, we have one quick question. Will old lessons created in earlier versions of Anvil be available once the new version launches? Um, and the, old, the, the old version of Anvil is going away um, January 1st, 2021. And um, I think I did answer that um, in the, maybe I forgot to enter. Um, and going forward, uh, we don't plan to ever have this issue where some content from an old version of Anvil won't get migrated automatically. So this should be the last time that um, we have that issue. And my answer, I think, was just if it's an H5P, you can export the H5P and then import it into, into new Anvil. Um, there's also, I think, a question uh, is there a time limit uh, for student responses or is there a way to limit student responses? The answer is not currently, but um, we plan to add it um, in the next uh, six months or so. Um, currently, the time limit is, is five minutes for recordings. And there is no file uh, size limitations on uploads. Okay, and one more that was unanswered. With the voice recognition, do you hold the button and click? Do you hold it while you record or do you hold it and let go? You know, Jeff. Uh, let's, <laughs> I, think yeah. I need to, I think I need to see it. I, I yeah, think it's just like, click. yeah, push to speak, yeah. Le B. Does it just Le go, like, it just goes until it hears it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And that clearly my Ukrainian needs some work. I think we're out of time, folks. Feel free to write us. Um, our contact information is on that last screen of the top slide. Um, 
Um, one last question because Miriam is a friend. When using Canvas, we would have students register an handle or just share the link. Nope, Once if they're using it in Canvas, then their authentication all takes place in Canvas. So you don't have to worry about students having, um, creating a separate account. Thanks to uh, Northwest eLearn for hosting us. Um, we had a chance to present this at last year's conference live and it was a much rawer and rougher version. And so it's nice to have a chance to come back when we've had a year to learn along with the tool and learn along with you. Um, um, all the best to you language teachers out there and let us know if you use the tool and, and what you think of it. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff, Jelay, and Norman for the demonstration. This is super cool and exciting. Um, it's also very nice to see a number of friends from overseas. It's I'm excited. Um, so thank you very much for your participation and contribution to our community. Um, so we're going to close the webinar now. We're running out of time. Um, but if you have any questions, please feel free to reach, reach out to us. Thank you. Bye for now. Thanks. Thanks.